everybody. Come on back in from the break. We're going to get into the sermon here in just a second. Pastor Nate here. Got a few things I wanted to let you know about. First is last week we raised or we received an offering for Pastor Lily Wilson to help kids with eye care in Hitali, Kenya. And our goal was $3,000. We were able to bless her with around $7,000 of gifts. So we're sending that her way. And praise God for that. That's something worth clapping for. That's something worth celebrating, praising God for. That's a great moment. So, yeah, go ahead. Clap. And praise God for that. Awesome thing. My family and I, Shauna and the kids and, and me, we're, we're not there today. We are actually up in Michigan. Some of y'all know that I've been in a uh, doctoral program for the past several years. And I'm, I'm graduating uh, this, this weekend. So we're up there celebrating that. And for the sermon today, I've asked a good friend of ours, uh, Gina White, to bring the Word of God. Gina is involved with Chi Alpha, which is a ministry to college students, and I'm sure she'll explain a little bit more about that here in just a second. But she uh, is involved with Chi Alpha. I've known Gina uh, for, for quite a while, and we're both huge Carolina Tar Heel fans. And so my promise to you is I will always put a Carolina Tar Heel fan in the pulpit whenever possible. You wish I was kidding. Anyway. Um, but she's bringing the word today. She's a fantastic preacher, and I want you all to give Gina White a rowdy Albemarle first welcome, and just love on her and her husband as they're here today, and welcome Gina. Take it away and preach the gospel. Hey, it's so great to be with you this morning, as Pastor Nate said, or I should say, as Dr. Nate said. Um, I am Gina White. I work with Chi Alpha Campus Ministries. You may never have heard of Chi Alpha. That's okay. We are the college outreach to the secular university campus on behalf of the Assemblies of God. So we're missionaries. Um, I know that sometimes my height makes it difficult to gauge my age, but I've been working for Chi Alpha for 22 years. So my college, my uh, ministry education and um, career in ministry are the same age as most of the students that I interface with. And that is a very significant wake up call on most days. I work out of the district office for the Assemblies of God. And so I help pastor, um, equip, resource, recruit for Chi Alpha across the state of North Carolina. We have about seven campuses here. Lord willing, we'll be adding two more in the next two years. And one way that you guys are already a part of what Chi Alpha does is that you support Chi Alpha Ministries through me. And so thank you for being a part of seeing lives of college students transformed. I have two prayer requests for you. Um, moving from this week, we have um, a huge conference. And Chi Alpha always has weird acronyms. I just want to get that out of the way. Um, our conference is called SICKEM. It's not like the dog command, but it sounds like it. It stands for Student Institute of Campus Ministry. And really what it is, is a discipleship week at the beach. We will be in North Topsail Beach May 13th through the 19th with around 100 college students. And some of them know Jesus. Some of them don't. So would you pray for our beach week? Would you pray that people would have significant encounters with the Lord, that they would be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and what they learn at that beach conference would not just stay there, but they would take that back to their university and that they would serve as an ambassador for Jesus for the campus around them. The second prayer request is that we don't want to just stay on the campuses where we are. We want to grow, and you have Pfeiffer, and you have Stanley Community College down the road. Every time you pass signs, you're driving around, and there's a lot of them in North Carolina, and you're driving around, and you may see a community college sign or a university sign. Would you just pray? And, it, and it's a very simple prayer. I can even give you the words to say. Would you say, Lord, would you raise up laborers in the right time, in the right season for this campus? And we believe that the Lord will hear that prayer and answer that, and my prayer is that that is through Chi Alpha. 
I love college ministry. I love UNC Chapel Hill basketball, as Pastor Nate said. Um, I went to Chapel Hill. That is where my faith journey began. So good things can happen at Chapel Hill for those of you who have doubts. However, um, it was such a significant time in my life. I was on the uh, law track. I already had a job at a law firm. I was um, political science and Spanish, and this amazing thing happened where Jesus introduced himself to me through community and through his word. And then he said, would you come follow me vocationally as well? And I said, yes. And so I finished out my degree at UNC Chapel Hill, and I began my training with Chi Alpha, and here we are today. So there's a lot about my job now that involves translation. I work for the Assemblies of God. Most of the students that we are interacting with on campus are not Assemblies of God, nor are they Christian, right? So there's a lot of translation that happens there. And then I'm not college age anymore. So there's a lot of translation where I'm like, brace yourself, when I was your age, right? And that sentence right there already gives away. When I was your age, we had to plug in our computers for the internet and there was a dial tone. Brace yourself. When I was in middle school, we didn't have the internet. Brace yourself. When I was growing up, the wall had a phone on it, and that was how you got in touch with people. And if you called, much to my father's disappointment whenever I was in my teenage years, if you called and someone else was on the phone, you couldn't get through. There was a busy signal, right? And some of you are like, oh, thank you, Lord, that we are no longer in those days, right? And you can remember back sometimes um, things that predate that. My first television was a little black and white television. Right? It didn't have color. So translating that to a college student today that can pull their little computer out of their pocket <laughs> and look up directions, can look up all the things and make a call from it, it's a bit of a cultural shift. And this is how I feel on a day-to-day -day basis interacting with college students, but it's also how I feel when I read the New Testament. Or the Old Testament, right? I'm reading things and I'm going, I don't know what this is. I don't have a paradigm for this. I don't have, I don't have language for this. I don't have an experience of, of wandering in the desert. I can easily disconnect from what is being communicated because I can't identify with some of the details, right? But today... I want to take you with me and help translate along the way because I have come to love the Old Testament. I think that knowing more about the Old Testament helps deepen our understanding of who Jesus is. I think that you will deepen your understanding of the whole story of Scripture and that you will grow richer in your faith if you do the hard work of translating, okay? So that's where we're going to go today. We're going to be um, in Exodus. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the book of Exodus, what has happened thus far in the story, there is a creator God. He has created the heavens and the earth. He's created humans. Everything is lovely. They're in a garden. And then a couple days later, the humans are like, but we would like to decide what's good and evil. And so they take it upon themselves to do so, and sin enters the world, and there's brokenness. And we see humanity grow across the earth and God having patience with them. And this cycle starts in the Old Testament. And you can, you can trace it through every story in the book of Genesis, right? God reaches out to the people. He establishes relationship. Things are good for a few minutes. And then the people are like, but we want to do it our way. And they do. And then they have to bear the consequence of their actions, they live out the consequences of those actions, which, spoiler alert, they're not good. And God says, I can make a way for you. You just have to say yes. 
And they say, yes, Lord, we need you. We promise we'll be faithful. And so God makes a way. And then what happens? Things are good for a few minutes. And then the people are like, but we want to do our own thing, right? And then the cycle starts again. And so this is the cycle. This is a very general um, idea of what's happening. But this is the cycle of the Old Testament that you can trace from Genesis into Exodus. When we get to Exodus, there is a man named Moses. Some of you may have an idea of who I'm talking about. But what we see is that the people of Israel are now in Egypt. They have found themselves in a land that is not their own. And what we're told at the end of Genesis is that there's a good Pharaoh and there's favor. But what we're told at the beginning of Exodus is that that Pharaoh is no longer around. There's a new Pharaoh in town. And he is not excited about the Israelites. And so he begins to enslave them out of fear. So this is where our story picks up. God starts speaking to Moses and says, I'm going to use you to help deliver my people. And Moses is like, me? And he's like, yes, you. And he's like, but me? And he's like, yes, you. And he's like, but please, not me. And he's like, okay, fine. I'll send your brother with you, but you're going. You know, <laughs> like, you're going to deliver my people. And so God does this. He, he brings him before Pharaoh. Um, for some of you, this may be your association of, of uh, Moses, Charlton Heston, and the Ten Commandments, right? This is what I kind of knew of Exodus growing up. Like, I think there's a movie, maybe. I don't know. Um, and so you, you know the whole, like, let my people go. No, let my people go, right? This is, this is the same story. And so you have... God bringing a representative that is going to help deliver the people. We pick up in Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 14. So the people have left Egypt, and what happens is Pharaoh changes his mind. He's like, no, 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 no. We need to go get them. So he sends his army. And so as the people are leaving, are fleeing, Pharaoh starts pursuing them. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not... What this was he said to you in Egypt, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be silent. This is a terrifying situation, right? I think we can identify a little bit with, with the Israelites in this moment. Because there's an army, and there's water, and they're in between, right? This is not a comfortable place to be. They have no idea what's on the other side. They have no idea what God is going to do. And so from, from God's vantage point, it's not unlike, for some of you parents, maybe taking a road trip. And maybe you're going somewhere delightful like the beach or Disney World or someplace that your family just very, very much enjoys. You, the loving, kind parent, you know where you're going. And your children are in the back seat, and you're stuck in traffic, and it's awful. And your children say, why have you taken us away from our video games? We would so rather want to be there, right? Because they have no idea of what Disney World is like. This is kind of the mentality. This is a very human mentality. It's normal. Um, you know, you throw in the threat of death, and this is pretty, pretty understandable, right? So imagine this scene. You've got... The Egyptian army, you've got the people of Israel, you've got the sea, and Moses is saying, you only need to be silent. And I think that if I were there in that little moment, I would be like, I don't know about that. Did you see the army? Did you see the water? 
This feels like choices between death or other death. This is not like, oh, totally, I believe that this is going to act, this is going to go well. This is, there's a lot of fear, rightfully so. But I believe that this is also an opportunity for Israel to learn to trust. Because while it is an incredibly difficult situation, it is not a choice between death and other kind of death. It just so happens that the way to life is through death in this situation. So we have to remember that remembering and reminiscing are two different things, right? For the Israelites, they don't like being enslaved. But in this moment, they're reminiscing about their life in Egypt because the present feels much more difficult. It's easy to reminisce about the past whenever there are difficulties of the present. We talked a little about, a little about the work of translation. Um, some of you may think back and go, it was easier when I was younger. And there's probably some truth in that. I do want to validate that. And also, there's a lot of not true in that. How do I know? Because we have GPS right? Some of you know what it's like to try to drive down the road and unfold the paper map. Where are we? I don't know. I can't see the map. The lines are too small, right? You have to pull over, ask somebody, hopefully they will give you road names instead of landmarks, right? Hopefully you're not crossing state lines because if you do, you're either folding the book map open to the next state, or you better have the second paper map in the car. For some of you, you're like, I'm older, I'm, I'm younger than the paper maps. Yeah, but MapQuest was a thing. And do you remember what happens when you lose a piece of the paper? When I was um, beginning uh, my missionary vocational journey, I traveled around to a lot of the churches in North Carolina. Not a lot of the churches in North Carolina are on major highways. And so I would have to print out my MapQuest directions. Sometimes it was nine pages of directions. You think texting and driving is dangerous and difficult. Try reading paper directions on a map, right? And so there is ease that comes with GPS. Now, I get it. There's problems, right? Sometimes series like, oh, yeah, you're going to Kentucky. And you're like, no, I live in North Carolina. Why would you think I live in Kentucky, right? But there's, there's also an ease that we can, can forget by reminiscing about things in the simplistic past. So this is where the Israelites are. They are reminiscing about being enslaved in Egypt. They'd rather be back there. But Moses challenges them to lean in, to see who God is. It is an invitation for the people to trust God. Not an easy one, but it is an invitation. Verse 13, Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. The word salvation appears one time before this in the book of Genesis, but this is the first time that the word is used in reference in a narrative to the rescue of a people. And this becomes the defining uh, way that we think about the term salvation. It is this reality that they have to go through what looks like death in order to find freedom and life. And they're told to stand and do nothing. Watch what God will do. So Exodus 14, 21 through 25 says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the dry land. And the waters were divided, and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea, on, and the waters being a wall in them to their right and to their left. The Egyptians pursued, and they went in after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, all the chariots, and all his horsemen. And in the morning, 
In the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So Egypt pursues. Yahweh makes an impossible way. And we see as Yahweh confuses Egypt with the pillar of fire and the cloud, we see God bring salvation and rescue. And friends, you know and I know from reading this passage that this is nothing that humans can do. This is God going before his people. And what what cracks me up about this passage is that it is the Egyptians that recognize, and they're the ones that say, it's the Lord fighting for Israel, right? Just as, as Israel was told, you only need to be silent. The Lord will fight for you. The Egyptians recognize it. And so, in the midst of all this chaos, just join me for a second in thinking about that east wind driving the, wind, the water back all night. You've probably traveled out to our Outer Banks or maybe you um, go to the Myrtle Beach area from here. But wind and the coast is a different thing. It's a whole new level of loud. If you've ever tried to put up a beach umbrella, you know what I mean, right? So imagine what it would feel like to have a wind that is strong enough that is parting water all night long. I don't know about you, but I don't think I would have a peaceful, restful sleep that night trying to trust in the Lord. But this is what happens. And so Exodus 14, 31, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. And so the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Other translations here say that the people trusted in the Lord. We get to the other side of the sea, and immediately, the second the people understand that God has done what he said he would do, they begin to celebrate. And there's a worship song, not unlike what we sang this morning, quite honestly. Exodus 15, 2, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation, the people said. This is my God. And I will praise him, my father's God, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. They are hearkening back to the stories that they heard from their ancestors, from what you and I read in the book of Genesis. The God of Abram and Isaac and Jacob has delivered them. And he hasn't just delivered Abraham. And he hasn't just delivered Isaac. And he hasn't just delivered Jacob. He has now delivered this whole people. And what they have heard about their whole lives and the faithfulness of God has become tangible and real on the other side of that sea. And their response is the word salvation. This is the God of our salvation. This word in Hebrew is called is Yeshua. There's a name in Hebrew. Um, we translate it Joshua or Je- Jehoshua. But you know the Greek translation of this name. Jesus. The name Jesus means Yahweh saves. And so this God, the God who brings freedom, he has delivered the Israelites. They have seen his power in the impossible situation. They have walked through the dry valley of the shadow of death. And the Lord, Yahweh, has brought them out on the other side. And the same God, everyone say same God, the same God who delivered Israel works in our lives today, and he offers us salvation. He offers us freedom. And so I think there are a couple questions for us to reflect on. And they're questions 
that I think the Israelites had to deal with. The first question is, do we trust the Lord to lead us? Just as the presence of God led the Israelites, so his presence leads us. When we come into relationship with Jesus, when we become the people of God, he gives us his Holy Spirit. That spirit is not inactive. He is God living in us to guide us, to shape us into the people we have created to be, and to give us an insight, an alignment that we would order our lives according to his will. It is the opportunity to reverse the doing our own thing in the garden. God goes with them. God goes with us. And he doesn't just go with us. Friends, he goes ahead of us. And he comes behind us in the same way that that fire and that pillar of cloud was encircling the Israelites. You and I have the opportunity to abide or to live daily, moment by moment, in the life-transforming presence of God, the presence of Yahweh, the God who is. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Thanks be to God. Do we trust, right? Do we trust that the Lord will deliver us? Do we trust that the Lord will lead us? I think these are questions worth reflecting on. There's a lot of amazing things to take away from the book of Exodus. I think sometimes we want to get caught up in the geography and the timeline and all those things. And I think it's very intentional that the biblical authors don't give us a lot of detail because the details aren't the point in this particular case. The details that are given to us are the one that, ones that matter. And what we come away with from this story is that Yahweh God is a faithful deliverer. And if you keep reading the books, you recognize that that story remains the same yesterday and today and forever. God is our faithful deliverer. Amen. So in just a couple minutes here, I'm going to um, lead us into a time of prayer, but I would like to invite the section pastors to come forward and the worship team. As I've been praying and preparing for this message, I, I, I emailed back with um, Pastor Nate when he asked me to speak, and I said, here's some things that I've been kind of thinking on, and he said, well, you know, go with what the Lord leads you. And so I, I, I said, sounds great. So I just started praying, and as I was praying for you and as I was praying for this morning, um, two things came to mind. One, I want you to know this has nothing to do with me and this has everything to do with the God who wants to encounter you. I felt so strongly coming into this week, coming into this morning, that the God who shows himself faithful to Israel will show himself faithful to you. The God who brings freedom and deliverance will bring freedom and deliverance for you. And so I don't know where you are. I don't know your story. Pastor Nate didn't give me any inside track or information. I believe that what the Lord does in these moments is an opportunity between the Holy Spirit who knows you and you to respond. See, Jesus wasn't the backup plan. God has always, always been making a way for salvation for his people. And what starts in the Exodus, we see culminate in the resurrection and the life of Jesus. And what we see very plainly in Jesus's life is that the only way to life is through death. And we are invited in the same way that if we want to live the full spiritual life, the eternal life, it is a dying, a dying to self. It's a, it's a dying to saying, I'm not in control anymore. 
And it's a choosing just as the Israelites chose. And stepping on that ground, they still had to walk forward. And so it's a choice to trust. And so in just a moment, I'm going to invite people up. But if you're here today and you say, I am done trying to part the sea on my own. I need the God who delivers Israel. Then I would invite you to pray the prayer of salvation and just ask the Lord to direct and to deliver and to bring forgiveness and life for you. Maybe you're here this morning or are joining us online and you just need the seat apart. And I don't know what that means. Maybe that's a child that you're concerned about. Maybe that's a job situation. Maybe that's something that the Lord's been speaking to you in, your, in this previous series on peace of mind. I know two things. We serve a very powerful God. And we serve a very faithful God. And he has not changed the agenda. And so as I begin to pray, if that is you and you would like to pray with someone today in person, I would encourage you to make your way forward. If you're joining us online, just find a, a quiet space as much as you can within your, um, your current space to be able to pray. Lord Jesus, we need you. We need you, the God of our salvation. And so I ask, Lord, that here today that you would help us to walk as your people through dry land, out of slavery, into freedom, God, into the abundant life that you have called us into. Father, may we know your faithfulness, not just in the stories that came before us, but, Lord, in our present existence, that our lives may shine in a dark world and say to the world around us that you you are faithful. You are the God who provides. You are the God who is able. Lord, I ask on behalf of our friends here today that you would make a way where it feels like it's a choice between death and other kind of death. Lord, that you would make it a choice of death that leads to life. We believe you, Lord, and we choose to trust in you. And I ask, Lord, that you would help us that your Holy Spirit would help us in trusting you, that the community around of us, the community of believers would help us to trust in you. And that, Father, by your move, people would know that you are the God who delivers. We pray all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Exodus is the identity story for the Israelites. And it is the beginning of our identity story as the people of God. God, our Savior, makes a way. And just as the Israelites are reminded and encouraged that they need only to be silent for the Lord will fight on their behalf. I just want to serve as a reminder for you today that he is faithful and will fight on your behalf. Thank you so much. Amen. In my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so the goodness.
Come on, one more time. Sure, sing it out. And all my how old or how young that you are whether you're just barely walking or you're a hundred years old everything that was that the Holy Spirit that he's been working through us today is applicable to every one of us we're not too young we're not too old and I appreciate the word that was brought today because it has a resting place on our society and regardless of what you see on the news and all these colleges that's going on God is still moving in every one of these inst institutions. Regardless of what appears, God is still moving. And God is still able to save. Like the old saying goes, and the church age used to say decades ago, maybe they still say it, from the guttermost to the uttermost. God is still able to do wonderful things. And if I can say what you just said uh, at the beginning of your, of, of your sermon, whenever you see any kind of school or college or whatever ele from elementary to doctorate um, hopefully I won't butcher this if you see a sign pray that God will intercede into that school that uh, God will raise up leaders for God and for his kingdom in these schools according to his time and his season because folks if we try to do it on our, on, on our own, we're going to mess it up. It has to be according to the leading of the, uh, of the Holy Ghost, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and, and our obedience. It, that's what makes everything work. You've got the divine side, then you've got the human side, and they have to work in concert together. And uh, we're going to go ahead and do our image bearer. Okay. We are image bearers of the Most High God. We are covered by the love of Jesus. We have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. Because of the Holy Spirit's power within us, we will freely and we will recklessly give away this love of Jesus. We won't hold back. Amen. 